My name is Marian. I work for Mellanox in Switch Software Architecture team. And today I'm going to talk about P4 compiler backend for TC. Uh, so, a few words about what we are go going to cover today. Uh, first one is overview of the programmable forwarding pipelines. Uh, then I'm going to go briefly over the P4 language. Uh, it's, uh, description of how it can uh, help us with programming forwarding flexible pipelines. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce uh, Linux TC backend as a P4, for P4 target and uh, together with this uh, Linux TC architecture. Um, uh, then I'm going to go over the compiler backend design and implementation. Uh, follow that by some use case and demo, and we'll finish with, some, with the future work that needs to, that needs to be done for uh, making it even more flexible. Okay, so we'll start with the overview of the flexible, uh, uh, of the programmable uh, forwarding pipelines. Uh, so uh, we all are used to uh, this view of the legacy uh, fixed function pipeline. Uh, which has some ingress entry, uh, then, uh, uh, then some uh, set of uh, fixed function blocks that uh, perform this or that uh, match action, um, and some ingress parser on the beginning and the parser at the end. Uh, so as opposed to that, uh, hard hardware today uh, supports a little bit uh, more flexible uh, architecture, uh, which uh, besides of these uh, fixed function or uh, read-only blocks also supports some flexible blocks, uh, which include uh, ingress parser, uh, some flexible match action tables uh, that you can combine, uh, and a deparser or uh, as it is also uh, called a packet modifier. Uh, so you can actually... Uh, Comparing to the fixed function pipelines, you can actually uh, uh, jump between different blocks. You can uh, introduce uh, new protocols to your ingress parser. Uh, you can insert new tables with, flex, with this flex match action uh, block and uh, do some interesting stuff with that. So let's, uh, let's zoom in on the first uh, flexible block, which is uh, flex match action. So how it looks like, it's usually a set of uh, tables that uh, you have to define, which can be comprised in uh, different ways. They can be, uh, uh, they can perform a parallel lookup on a field in the packet. They can be chained into a list. Uh, you can do a go-to action from one table to another. So basically, you have some uh, flexibility in the packet in the packet lookup uh, in the match action block. So uh, together with match action block comes a flexible parser, which introduces, uh, which gives you a possibility to introduce uh, new protocols to your um, uh, to your pipeline. So it is uh, important to emphasize on. Uh, on a statement that this pipeline is not uh, considered a kind of a fully programmable. It is a superset of a fully programmable pipeline because this is a hybrid uh, mode pipeline. It includes both uh, programmable uh, pipelines and uh, fixed function blocks uh, to which you can always default and you don't have to reinvent, reinvent the wheel by uh, writing uh, from scratch uh, Ethernet, IP, and uh, higher level protocols. Uh, so a flexible parser uh, gives you a possibility to introduce new protocols into your pipeline. Um, in, a, in this way, you can, uh, so in this example, you can uh, build on top of UDP. So you can introduce quick, you can introduce new tunnels. And then in the uh, flex match action block, you can actually match on the fields of this protocol. And the 
third element of the uh, flexible <coughs> pipelines is the uh, flexible packet modifier. Uh, so uh, this block allows you to uh, build your new protocols on the, in, on the egress side. Oops. Okay, we're back. Um, so this way uh, you can introduce, uh, uh, similarly how you introduced uh, new uh, protocols to your parser, uh, the same way you can introduce uh, new templates for building uh, packet headers on the egress. And this way you can uh, do some modification, you can insert your own data, you can build tunnels, you can build telemetry, uh, depending on your use case, you can do pretty much everything. Okay, so having said that, um, we need some high-level programming language to actually be able to program all those flexible blocks. And uh, as of today, the best candidate that we see for, uh, for programming our hardware is uh, P4 language. Uh, to be more precise, P4 uh, 16, uh, P4 uh, standard of uh, 2016 of the year 2016 uh, and later, uh, and I will explain you why in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, short introduction uh, to P4 language, it, it's basically uh, built all on two sets of elements. Uh, first one is generic elements, the ones that uh, were uh, described before and some target specific elements. Uh, so the generic elements include um, the parser, uh, match action tables, and control blocks. So this is how it usually looks like in the code. Um, for the parser, it's uh, kind of a C-like switch statement in which having, uh, being in one state in your parsing tree, you can, uh, you can tr uh, transition to another one. Uh, match action tables, uh, this is actually the point where you define the keys by which you match on your header and then actions that you can perform. Uh, so this is all descriptive part. You, you do not actually populate entries here, but this is how you define your pipeline. And the last one is control blocks. Uh, so control blocks are actually uh, uh, helping you define how you apply your match action tables uh, and all the stuff uh, to your pipeline. Uh, at which stages, etc. And um, the target uh, target specific elements of the language are actions, uh, the target architecture itself, and uh, metadata that uh, is provided by this target. Uh, so a few words about each of them. Uh, so target. Uh, let's start from target architecture. This one is quite important uh, because it. Actually, it defines uh, a view of your target of your hardware uh, that will be presented to the programmer uh, that will write the P4 program. So it means that uh, as long as you provide a uh, target architecture for your hardware or some generic model, uh, it, it is, uh, by the standard, it is not portable between different targets. So for example, in Mellanox, we have uh, our compiler uh, that can already compile uh, P4 code to some uh, SDK calls, but it's not portable to, let's say, this Linux target architecture. And it's not portable to other hardware. Uh, so there's also a set of actions uh, that uh, hardware provides. Uh, so these are some basic building blocks uh, that allow you to do manipulations on the packet. So you can do some PBS, you can uh, set metadata, you can set the bridge, set fields on the packet, and so on and so forth. Um, and the last one is the standard metadata that is provided along with the packet. It, will, it can include some scratch pad uh, fields. It can uh, provide some information about the packet, like uh, where the packet ingressed from, what uh, the packet's uh, VR ID, et cetera. Um, okay, so as I said, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, write a P4 application uh, 
uh, without having a target. So uh, to be in order to be able to write P4 applications for Linux and to customize Linux, uh, we need uh, target architecture, which is specific to Linux. Uh, so we call it a Linux DC uh, target architecture. Um, in high level, it looks like this. So we have those uh, black uh, blocks that are read-only. We cannot modify them. And also, we can define, <coughs> we can define a programmable blocks uh, together with uh, some other stuff like uh, parser and packet modifier that I will talk about later. <laughs> but basically, this is what we need to be able to write before application applications for Linux. Mm -hmm. um, so how it looks like uh, from the compiler point of view. So uh, P4 uh, community already provides a standard common front end for all the backends. So for all the target architectures, uh, there is already a common front end, which uh, gives you uh, for free some uh, syntactic analysis, some semantic analysis, so uh, all the P4 code is already parsed for you and uh, all the symbol tables are, are built, so you can just use, use them. And what we did, uh, we, uh, we wrote our own backend, uh, which uh, basically <coughs> translates uh, P4 program into TC calls. Uh, it has, uh, it generates several layers. First one is the base layer. It's uh, some TC, uh, generic, uh, uh, TC, generic uh, C code that uh, uh, configures uh, TC rules in Linux. Uh, it uh, looks kind of like add entry to the table, remove entry, uh, stuff like that. Um, and uh, the layer above is the API that allows you to actually configure uh, entries in Linux uh, through TC. Uh, so for that, we chose a, a common uh, way that P4 community works. We chose a P4 runtime API, uh, which gives you some nice RPC calls uh, to provision your uh, to provision your target to. Uh, to configure everything, and uh, there's also some nice CLI with auto completion and some verifications of the parameters that you can use, which is auto generated and built for your uh, pipeline and for your tables that you programmed. And uh, thanks to Switch Dev, we can nicely offload uh, all this, uh, all these uh, TC rules into the hardware. So uh, basically. Uh, the part that's, that's implemented in here is already supported and offloaded to all hardware in Malinux, so both Switch and NIC uh, can work with that. Um, okay, so current state of the work. Uh, first, I need to tell that uh, backend is not yet uh, available uh, in open source. Uh, it's Currently, it's in a POC stage, so I'm going to publish it in coming months. Um, okay, so what we have there is uh, the flower filter-based uh, matching. Uh, we have a hardware uh, offload possibility, of course, uh, a Linux target architecture definition. So what this means uh, is that uh, we have uh, defined uh, control blocks that you can program. For now, it's only an ingress part, uh, but we're going to extend that. Uh, along with that, you have a set of default headers that um, TC already supports, so you can uh, write matches on them. Uh, a auto-generated P4 runtime API for configuring all of this and a convenient CLI for populating populating table entries along with uh, P4 runtime CLI. And what's not yet supported, uh, first one is kind of a big one, uh, programmable parser and modifier. So in case you want to uh, be able to uh, work with your own protocols uh, on top of some of the existing, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so you will need a uh, programmable an infrastructure in TC to be able to uh, parse uh, new protocols and to do matches later on. Um, 
and counters. Also, TC has a counters out of the box. Uh, they are not yet provided in uh, in this compiler backend version, but it's it's going to be also added very soon. Okay, so a short use case and demo that I wanted to sh uh, to present. Uh, so uh, I wanted to do some uh, some configuration, uh, some pipeline that is uh, that I can actually uh, offload regardless of the hardware that I, that I have. Uh, so for that, I took one Malnox switch, I took one Malnox NIC, uh, which is on the host above, and I just uh, compiled my program and configure all the hardware as if it is a homogeneous system all the way. Uh, so the demo is pretty straightforward. I just, uh, based on the source uh, IP of the packet, I am doing a stateless lo load balancing between different uh, VMs. Uh, so I just split the address space uh, in half, and then propagate it later and split again. Uh, so uh, so all, the, uh, all the VMs will receive more or less uh, similar uh, workload. Uh, so how it would look in TC. So what you actually need to write to make it work, uh, sorry, in P4. So, uh, what you actually need to write to make it work in P4 uh, is uh, one thing. So uh, since we are not uh, introducing new protocols, you just have to add one table. Um, so you see that uh, for now, the only uh, programming point that supported is control ingress. So you put your table into the ingress point of your pipeline, uh, specify the keys, uh, which is a IPv4 source address, which is an LPM match, uh, actions, action is two port, uh, and uh, then you uh, say that you want to apply this table, and that's it. Um, next, you do more or less the same thing that you would do with a C program, you compile it uh, in kind of a GCC style, you provide a source file, you provide an output path and some arbitrary attributes like uh, switch architecture, which is TC in our case. Um, and then you need to actually populate these entries. Uh, you, you can do it with a uh, auto-generated CLI. Uh, the syntax is uh, kind of like uh, provided here. Uh, so you you will need a few entries per uh, your host. Uh, so basically you add uh, all the prefixes and tell to which port uh, you want to go. So I have a three minute demo. I'll try to, to share it one second, how it actually works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to duplicate. Okay, now you can see it, right? Okay. <coughs> so I'm gonna show how you actually, uh, having already compiled the application, how you populate all this stuff to your Linux machine. So what I did, I spawned a few client VMs on the left side, few, um, server VMs on the right side. So the client VMs uh, are in separate halves of the address space uh, so that they will be distributed to different uh, hosts. And uh, the VMs, uh, VMs have the same configuration. Uh, basically, I, I configured the same IP address to, virtual IP address to, the, uh, to all the um, servers, and then I'm just steering a traffic between them. So, okay, let's fast forward. Okay, let's see. So in here, uh, no traffic is passing through, as you will see in a few seconds. So uh, the servers are not uh, reachable, uh, reachable from the client. And um, now let's configure some rules. 
so all the CLI is auto-generated, so, uh, so you don't actually need to write a code to have it working. Uh, so the syntax is uh, pretty simple. It's uh, add entry to the table, you specify name of the table, you specify keys, and uh, you specify the action, which is the IF index of the port that you want to, uh, to send to steer the traffic to. And the other half of the addresses will go to another port. And that's it. So that's all you need to do to make it work, besides compiling, of course. And you see that underneath, uh, this is all the uh, all the standard TC uh, rules, which are nicely loaded into the hardware. And that's it. Okay, so uh, one. Can, I, can you go back there? I'm sorry, I, I have a question. Because you, you inserted something 128? Yeah. But then the address is 192, and where you. Uh, yeah, 192 uh, fits into 128 and above. So it has uh, one in the first bit, and yeah. the other one has zero in the first bit. So that's how they are okay. split into two parts. Okay, and um, the last one, white. Ah, two slides. YTC, first one. Uh, because we, of course, like Jamal. Uh, next, uh, TC, despite, uh, despite being kind of confusing, it's still highly flexible. This is the, uh, one of the most flexible infrastructures that I've had to work with. Can, can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, and besides that, it has uh, lots of benefits as opposed to other targets that I was working with uh, if we are talking about P4. So Linux uh, s software implementation uh, can be used as a reference platform, which is a kind of a main killer of all the others because when you have some, uh, you don't always have some hardware to work with. You, you want to have a software platform that you can just program and you want to, uh, you want to actually just try it on your laptop and, um, and see some results without purchasing any hardware. Uh, so it is unified across hardware uh, as well. Uh, so uh, since this is a reference platform, all hardware needs to conform to it. Um, and uh, then it can either offload uh, the stuff or uh, basically we, we see the same uh, behavior across all the hardware that's working uh, with Linux, uh, with TC. Um, okay, so it's open, uh, no proprietary SDK as opposed to all of the other stuff that I've seen. Uh, and what you need is open compiler along with the backend that I am going to provide and uh, vanilla Linux, that's it. Um, another huge benefit uh, to other target architectures that I uh, see here is this uh, hybrid architecture model. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You already have L2, L3, you have uh, tunnels, uh, standard tunnels, you have uh, everything to work with, you can just add on top of it. Um, yes, yeah, so that's it. Um, future work that we need to do probably together. Uh, we need to think of some way of introducing a programmable parser and modifier to TC, because it's not in a part of uh, TC infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> uh, also, I need to expose uh, TC counters. Uh, we are thinking of adding, uh, of enriching the action set and uh, standard filter set of uh, TC filters. And uh, also some interesting uh, thing to do will be introducing more binding points instead, uh, it, besides the standard ones which are ingress and egress. So uh, it's like IP tables having more than two, like uh, pre-routing, something like that. Okay, so that's it. Any questions? That's an exciting talk. Come on, I'm just I'm going to pick somebody to ask a question. Oh.
Thanks. So first of all, this is really nice. Um, I assume there could be stuff that can be written in P4 which is, cannot be translated to TC right now. So what happens in your process when that happens? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, there is this first uh, big thing that we need to address is flexible parser and flexible uh, modifier, which uh, is a generic construct of P4 language which is not yet in TC, and it uh, it will just not work if you try to do something like that right now. Another thing, uh, so sometimes uh, people get confused because uh, you can, in P4, generally, you can write different kinds of stuff depending on your target architecture. And uh, that's why we need to define our target architecture for Linux. Because what, what I've seen from the research papers, people were doing some crazy stuff, uh, which then wasn't applicable to any hardware. So they just took some software model, like uh, there is one popular uh, BMV2, which, is, which does, just does not map to any hardware. And if you write something there, it's not portable. Uh, so yes, yeah, so as long as you are, uh, as long as we were, will address the problem of a flexible parser and flexible modifier, uh, as everything else is constrained with the target architecture and will be uh, properly handled with uh, compiler errors, errors uh, if you go beyond your target ar architecture. Is that Spectrum ASIC? Uh, yes, so for switch, we used Spectrum ASIC. And right. were there changes to the driver as well? Mm. Like SysW? No changes no. to the driver. Just it, it's just, uh, yeah, right now we support the floating of TC. So, so that, that yeah. just works again. So uh, I have a question here. So uh, you said it, uh, TC doesn't support the modifier. Uh, isn't p-edit enough, or what am I missing? Uh, Jamal, correct me if I'm wrong, p-edit does not support adding uh, new headers. Yes, you can't e expand or contract. Ah, okay. Um, I have uh, uh, one more question. Since I don't understand p4 very well, uh, I couldn't get why you need p4 runtime and then TC. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. So. Um, P4, uh, any P4 program is compiled into uh, two pieces. First one is some kind of binary blob defined by the target, uh, which uh, describes your platform. And second one is the API that you need to actually populate entries to your tables. And we just chose P4 runtime, so it can be, it can be something else. No, I understood that part, but if you use P4 runtime API to program the rules, why do you still need TC? Or um, I think it's the control interface. The yeah, this uh, this is like the base layer for all the APIs, uh, which can be used uh, to add entries to the table. So this is generic and uh, does not know which API uses it. Yeah, the, the, I think the question is why P4 runtime. I I had that in my head as well. I know, but but it's you have a raw interface to the hardware. Mm -hmm. And you picked one way of doing of interfacing to that raw API, which is P4 runtime. P4 runtime is, I could have written a different runtime, not the one that is being presented by P4.org. And I suspect there'll be other vendors who do not want to use P4 runtime, for example. Yeah, but you still um, you still have this base layer uh, that provides you an. Uh, a generic uh, API, uh, which looks kind of like um, add entry to the table, remove entry from the table. So yeah, look, it's based on protobufs and all that uh, enlightened things. But it's still it's still talking to raw. Uh, what, what are you? Talk, what is the P4 runtime talking to? It's talking uh, to so the P4 the, runtime is the talking PI to interfaces to, to the. Uh, on the way down to the Linux? Okay. Yes, I think that's, in my opinion, that's the best thing to expose is the PI interface, not P4 runtime. But I can understand. Yeah. Yeah, be below that is uh, auto generated code that uh, actually right. populates uh, configuration to Linux. But what is that uh, lower level API that uh, P4 runtime runs on? Uh, yeah, so this is a C library that just uh, configures TCVL Netlink. Oh. 
Okay. Okay. And, and that, that backend could be used by anybody who doesn't want to use yeah. it before runtime. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay. In your last slides, you mentioned that two things that might be missing is a flexible parser and also more binding points. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of sounds like uh, where BPF uh, comes into the kernel. Could you could you create uh, BPF as your like uh, um, a hybrid backend, which would be TCN BPF or only BPF? Uh, yes. Yeah, so first thing about BPF, uh, it's not um, offloaded. Uh, at least it's not easily offload it to the hardware, uh, but most likely uh, you cannot use uh, uh, BPF code. Uh, so uh, the problem here uh, that you need to have um, single entry, which in my point of view is TC and not BPF. Uh, and uh, well, what I mean uh, by uh, multiple binding points, uh, I'm not sure if BPF has that as well. Uh, so. Today, you cannot uh, bind your BPF code to pre-routing stage, right? So B BPF has many uh, available hooks in kernel. Yeah, but the, the point is that uh, you, you need to have something that can be offloaded by hardware. Okay, so can you offload uh, BPF to your ASIC? Okay. First of all, this is not this is not dedicated for offload, right? What you, what you described here is a way for someone to configure TC using P4. Yeah, but I, whether I, or not the TC I, is offloaded. I, I look at BPF as a separate backend, so you already have a backend for BPF uh, upstream, so you you can take that if you want to. Uh, but uh, I want to work with TC because uh, the way it's designed, uh, it can be offloaded to hardware, and we want to do more extensions to TC to make it uh, offloadable and so that people can work with TC basically without BPF. Sure, I, I understand that. I'm mm -hmm. also for the offload of TC. Just uh, seems like a good fit for... Yeah, so actually if you, if you want to use BPF, there is already a compiler, a compiler backend for BPF, uh, so you can look into it. But as for now, it's quite limited. It only, it's also only on ingress and uh, it's only filtering, not much. I don't understand the reason why you don't uh, translate in one place the, um, uh, the P4 to TC and you need a runtime. I mean, typically you figure out what are the appropriate commands and you mm -hmm. can write down a DSL program like P4 in one place and run it and... Okay, uh, so P4 language is a descriptive language, so uh, it does not... Uh, so the P4 code itself does not give you uh, the uh, the configuration of your hardware. So you need some way to configure your hardware having these tables defined in P4. That's why you need an API, additional yeah. API. Yeah, but there is a compiler who provides the um, machine-specific, uh, the ASIC-specific code. I mean, in any case, I mean, P4 is translated to uh, target specific architecture, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, is there any kind of uh, the P4 DSL which cannot be translated and you need the API for that? Uh, well, conf configuring your hardware is out of the scope of uh, P4 program. So, yeah, I mean, is there any lack of P4 expressiveness that cannot be handled with a TC? the DSL language. Okay, well, let's catch the guy at the break. Okay. Marianne, thank you. <laughs>